Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to another edition of CPAS Foundation STEM Stories Live, where we invite promising black and brown doctors, students, and resident medical professionals to speak about their journey through STEM fields. I'm Ginger Birkenbuehl, the CEO of Burke Creative and the moderator of these vibrant conversations. Um, CPAS Foundation, which stands for Creating Pathways and Access for, Access for Student Success, was created to attract, encourage, educate, guide, and increase the number of promising yet underrepresented Illinois students in STEM and STEAM-related professions. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math, and the A in STEAM adds arts to the mix. Our goal is to guide students to their full potential in evolving, well-paying industries such as robotics, coding, artificial intelligence, gaming, programming, mobile apps, web design, the arts, healthcare, bioengineering, and all kinds of amazing things, virtual reality mm -hmm. included. Um, please consider making a donation to cpassfoundation.org slash invest in us. That's cpassfoundation.org slash invest hyphen in hyphen us to ensure that black and brown students have a chance to realize their dreams. I'm excited today. Today's STEM story highlights Dr. Ariel, Ariel August, a surgical resident at Stanford, focusing on diversity, empowerment, and medical education. A passionate writer, her voice has been featured in Forbes, SheMD, and General Surgery News. And as an appointee of the ACS American College Surgeons Cancer Surgeon um, Education Program Education Committee, she's reimagining medical education through residency and fellowship development. A proud black woman, surgeon, and student, she strives to be a visible role model for other black girls curious about careers in STEM. Please join us right now to welcome Dr. August. Welcome to our platform, CPAS <laughs> Foundation STEM Stories. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so great to have you. So, so great to talk to you. There's so much we could talk about, but we have a very limited amount of time because you had a very, very busy day at work yesterday, working until six o'clock this morning or seven yes it was like it was night call but yes it was it was a busy shift night is that i mean how many hours are we talking uh 12 hours they're usually 12 Ooh. hour shifts yeah like the standard is yeah you just split the day in half it makes it math easy <laughs> <laughs> makes it math easy okay well listen let's 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 get right to it so um i want to jump right into your twitter handle because i think it's amazing black girl surgeon which is black g r l surgeon you look like a creative and a designer dressed up in doctor's clothes to me, right? So yeah. <laughs> why are you becoming a surgeon instead of a product designer, for example? Like, tell me what is happening there. Well, who said I couldn't be both, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, yes, Black Girl Surgeon, the, the Twitter handle actually is kind of um, an interesting story. And in that I remember um, around medical school time, I was having a lot of conversations with pre-meds and undergrads and, um, when I was coming up, there weren't any black surgeons that I knew of to like find and search for and all that. And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna make my Twitter handle. I'm like ready to like make a brand. And, I, and my cousin was like, why don't you just do like black girl surgeon? And I was like, that seems like really bold, maybe a little aggressive, you know? And then I was like, it's just literally what I am. Like, you know, like it just the fact that like putting those words together feels aggressive. But I'm like, that's, it's a very simple way to actually, uh, you know, name me. And so I went for it. And um, it's actually it has been really good because it makes people really easy to find me. <laughs> mm -hmm. on, um, and it's kind of straightforward to the point that I really do want to be a visible um, face and, and as a diversity in medicine and in, in creativity. So I think the why I just chose surgery um, is not necessarily a product design route, um, which I actually had always planned to kind of do both. Um, when I was little, I was really interested in prosthetics and design and that kind of thing. So I did my undergrad in biomedical engineering because I wanted to create initially a prosthetic leg for horses because that I was really, really mm -hmm. sad when I found out that race horses had to be put down, they like broke a leg or something. And I was like, we need to create a prosthetic leg for horses. I was, you know, like eight or 10 years old when this happened. Um, and I asked my parents and I was like, who does that kind of thing? And they're like, oh, a biomedical engineer. Like that's the people that do that, that invent things. And I was like, cool, that's what I'm gonna be. Um, and slowly that evolved into, uh, you know, human prosthetics. Um, I was Then I was like, oh, okay, I've got a plan. I wanna also implant these prosthetics myself. Uh, and so I thought I was gonna be a neurosurgeon. So I wanted to work with like the brain machine interface. And so that's how I did biomedical engineering and then worked in a neural prosthetics lab at Duke for um, five years. I started this summer after my freshman year as a Howard Hughes fellow and stayed on for a gap year afterwards. Um, and so, yeah, then I got to medical school and realized I love general surgery way more than neurosurgery, um, but always plan to come back to it. And that's how we're kind of where I am now is taking the time to, to really 
um, solidify my like design skills and product and working in medical devices. And it's really, really exciting and enriching to be on both sides of the coin to like be in patient care and a surgeon operating, which I love because it's very hands-on, it's very technical, it's skilled work, um, very impactful. You get a big, like you, you're a really big part of people's lives at a really critical point. And then also on the other side, getting to be creative and um, think about problems in new ways and, and really bring an equity lens, bring some like a different viewpoint to kind of um, to product design and medical device design that you don't usually see. So. You know, Long I love that. Answer. I know it's okay because, um, you know, I own um, a visual identity and brand strategy agency. That's what I do. And um, my company is the agency of record for CPAS Foundation. So I completely understand that. I love the intersection. That was actually my next question because I feel like, um, in some ways, people would say, you know, creativity and medicine are mutually exclusive. And you just explained the intersectionality of those two things. Um, and you also explained how you found the path to make those happen. I do think that a lot of younger students, they don't, you know, they think doctor, doctor, all there is is a doctor, right? They don't actually see the potential for going into a STEM field and mm -hmm. maybe becoming a doctor, maybe not, but, but still being involved in creating products or solutions in medicine. You know, you're describing something that I never would have thought of. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a, on the 100% pretty much creative side and strategy side. I never mm -hmm. would have thought, you know, as you thought, wow, I can actually make, you know, prosthetics for horses. I mean, that's a, that's an astonishing, beautiful thought. And um, it almost makes me wonder, you know, does being a creative and what I feel like you're sounding to me like an entrepreneurial mindset, do you think that that makes for a better doctor or is it more like this makes for a better, a better experience going through medical school? I mean, what... How does this actually mm -hmm. make it better or does it or not? Yeah, so the, um, to your first point where it seemed like a lot of um, kind of like medicine and creativity are a bit mutually exclusive. And I would say that's very true. Like medical training throughout medical school, it's very regimented. Okay. You do things the same way for, you know, we've been doing things same for hundreds of years and that's what you learn. Um, but I've always kind of had this creative side to me. And, and I think that's why I stuck with engineering as an undergrad, as opposed to kind of just doing the biology or, or, or you know, anthropology that it's kind of like what it just got me my prereqs and like stayed in the same way. Like I needed something, I needed to build, I need to like create some change in the world um, that really kind of drove me. And so I was always on the lookout for a way to, to merge the two. Um, and they were, and they didn't happen until now because like undergrad was very, creative engineering, med school was like just medicine. And I didn't really get to do anything with my engineering degree. And it wasn't until I got to residency now, and particularly on my research years, or as we call them at Stanford, your professional development time, um, that I was like, okay, how do I wanna shape my career? How do I wanna shape this? And I think um, one, the, uh, the outlet to be creative, um, I did the Biodesign Innovation Fellowship, which is a needs-based process for learning medical device innovation. It basically is like, how do you take an idea in the medical field once you identify a need and bring it all the way to a product? It teaches you that process, which is great hands-on wow. learning. Mm -hmm. um, and just like, it finally, like, oh, I'd be in the hospital and be like, oh, this is done really poorly, or we could do this better, or like, we need a better tool. Like, why am I fumbling with this, like, you know, retractor X, Y, Z? Um, and now through biodesign, I learned like, hey, you can take that problem and turn it into a solution. And because you, I had the hands-on knowledge of actually ex being the end user, and then now getting to go back and be actually like in influencing the the new creation, I think it's a much richer experience um, than just being on one or the other sides. Right, um, right. So I think they well, really inform each other and and are quite complementary. I really love that because um, when I think about product design and inclusion in product design. Um, inclusion means so many things to me. It means having cultural mm -hmm. competency. It means under. It means to me understanding um, different types of ways that people experience their product. It it it's about accessibility. Um, mm -hmm. It's about language. It's about all kinds of things. And I feel like what you're describing is a mindset of understanding and openness and curiosity, which helps you translate. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you being a doctor into something much, much more than just being a doctor. And I feel like when I hear these things, I think this is what young people need to understand, right? When I when we talk yeah. about how do we get young people medical careers, because it really does broaden the scope. Not saying that you you can't you you have to still go through the fundamentals like you described, really rigorous, um, you know, medical training, right? I mean, it's difficult mm -hmm. 
to become a product designer in any you know scope of work you know whether it's you know designing you know the apple earbuds or yeah. even designing the simple yellow pen to developing you know a prosthetic mm -hmm. device there's still an incredible amount of training but i think that um you know understanding the impact of what you're creating on human life to me is a, is a, is a passion space right um, so i'm kind of curious um i read tell me if i'm wrong you wanted to be a surgeon at age eight and yeah. right is that correct? Mm -hmm. so yeah. Like, oh my god! Like, I know. When I was eight years old, I was like not thinking about that. I mean, I, I just feel like I no, nobody even asked me. Child. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I want to know um, as you as you studied up from med middle school to medical school, were there other black girls in in middle school that were interested in medicine, and were there other were there black women in medical school making the journey with you? Because I'm like thinking. Were you the only one standing there, you know, being all like amazing and creative or did you see other models and things like that? I mean, talk um, about that a little bit. I got very comfortable being the only one in the room, you know, <laughs> at very, very early. I, I know it's, it's, it's unfortunate and not to say I didn't have wonderful friends and a very like diverse group of friends. Um, I was lucky enough to grow up in South Florida that has, it's like a very rich melting pot kind of population, which is really nice. I like to make the differentiation from North Florida and South Florida. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're different places. Um, but yeah, and so, and, and I was always a like science, math, question driven kind of child. My parents got me this question and answers encyclopedia, I think around, you know, six, seven years old. And I just like devoured, it was literally just a book of questions about the world and they answered them for you. And I would spend all day just being like, I wanted to know everything. Um, and so even through medical school, middle school and high school, um, I often was kind of the only person of color in my AP classes and my pre-med classes. And then especially when I got to, um, to undergrad at Duke, which is very, very um, like racially segregated socially, um, it, which is an interesting thing, which was new for me. I had always like very much integrated my friend life and everything. Um, it wasn't until I got to Duke that I kind of had only black friends, but then I was in the engineering school where there were not many other black people. I think there was one other black woman in my major, in my class in biomedical Were there women there? Um, there were some women. Okay. <laughs> there were some women. I mean, I uh, feel like the first place is like, are there any yeah, like women? Yeah, just starting with women, right, exactly. So like definitely less <laughs> than, than men. Um, and then, yeah, I think, and one of my best friends is um, an engineer that was in mechanical engineering my year and we're still best friends this day. Um, another black, amazing black woman who got me through like intro coding. And <laughs> so, so you yeah. had some, you had some exposure later in life. So in the early mm -hmm. years, you, you were pretty much the only one, but once you actually yeah. got into, um, you know, the universe at the university level, you started mm -hmm. seeing some women of color, right? Um, yeah. And they're still at my level, not really in leadership though. So okay. like, no professors, no, when I was doing my rotations in the hospital, um, rarely any, you know, doctors there. Um, I think if you read anything from people that went to Duke at undergrad, you'll see this kind of theme, um, especially from um, young black kids about a lot of the um, ancillary staff at, at Duke, because Durham is a primary like, black community, um, were, were, were black and people of color. And every day on there, it was like, they took the time to say like, we are rooting for you. Like, we are so proud that you're here and like, you're doing it for all of us. And like, that drove a, drove a lot of us. It was like having a, you know, it's like having your village or community right there on campus. And it was just such a, a strong and stark, uh, you know, contrast to saying like, you know, this is where they're used to seeing us. And, and we're so excited that this is where we're going. Um, and it's really, really powerful. Well, I love that. Um, and I, I guess one of the challenges that I have and that I'm learning and as I, you know, continue to, um, you know, partner with the CPAS Foundation, many black doctors, male and female, they really have a tough time in the community, you know, and their families uh, getting their curiosity supported. Um, it sounds like you had an upbringing that did not discourage you from curiosity. And so what I wanna know from your perspective, and it's really your perspective, you can't speak for anyone but your own, what would you say to a middle, middle schooler that doesn't have that, that recognition and joy of curiosity in their family and their community? Because um, you, know, you made it through, but you sound like you had a very strong foundation to do so. And there's many black 
um, people, black families, black children, you know, when you have a super smart kid, like super smart, you know, you know, and I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting this is wide scale, but I mean, even a super creative kid, you know, oftentimes can get slapped down for being different. Yeah. yeah um, how would you, like, what would your, what would you say to that? Like, how do you, how do you talk to a child like yourself, mm -hmm. a little black girl, like a little black girl version of yourself in an environment that's not as, you know, go and find the answer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I will say that I was very, very fortunate. I had an incredible upbringing and my parents allowed it, afforded me one, the opportunity to grow and explore and, and always supported me in that. And I think I would say um, for young black creative kids, curious kids, I would say that the drive inside of you that is asking those questions, you can always turn there. Like you can always turn there for that support, even if you're not getting it from the outside. I'm a big fan of always like follow your passion, listen to that inner voice because the the, the point and purpose of life, right, is, is to is to seek your own joy and it'd be great if you can also you know contribute to the world in some way with that. But if we are all living up to our full potential, like you are manifesting what you're here to do. And so if, even if you can't find it outwardly, look inside, find, find your community. You might find other kids that are also really curious that you can talk to trusted teachers or other mentors that you can look around for. And I love the library. I know it's COVID now. So maybe there's not a lot of public libraries open. No, I think they, they are open. open. They're opening they again. Great. I was yeah. like, the library was always a great place. There was one like in my house. It's open all the time. It's free. And like, there's so many answers just right there. And and people in libraries are also pretty cool and like to answer questions. And so, yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> libraries are also, they're safe spaces too, right? Exactly. Um, you know, they're I think that spaces. they're, you know, it's not like the place that, you know, like yeah, everyone exactly. doesn't go and like hover at a library and, and hang out and do things, right? I mean, I feel like right. that's, a, that's a great suggestion. Um, I, I love you for saying that. I know it's challenging because trying to, um, you know, create a, a cocoon for a curious child, especially a black mm -hmm. child, is integral to their success, I feel, yeah. in the future. You know, they've got to have a place and an anchor to say, oh, I see something, somebody believes in me, somebody sees me and 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 champions, you know, my curiosity and, and wants me to be successful. There has to be a way um, for black um, young students to find those people. And it, it really mm -hmm. does require some listening strategies as a very young person, which is really hard because I mean, mm -hmm. I have a teenager right now, he doesn't listen to anything, you know, but um, but I mean, in general, it's, it's important that a young person listens, you know, and speaking of um, COVID-19 pandemic. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the United States, this pandemic has really, really exposed so much um, mm -hmm. in terms of systemic, um, deficits in medicine, right? Mm -hmm. um, the lack of experience, personalized care, cultural understanding of black communities and their health, um, all kinds mm -hmm. of things. I mean, we knew, we as black people, we knew mm -hmm. this because we live it. You know, we lived it every day. We've, we've experienced it. Even, you know, those like you who are you know, well resourced with, you know, strong, um, you know, families that are very supportive, whatever your economic situation was, um, we mm -hmm. still experienced incredible um, deficits in, in, a, in a lot of different ways. And I, and I don't say that in the sense that there is no such thing as abundance. I'm just saying there's real mm -hmm. systemic barriers. What yeah. do you think from your opinion, based on the journey that you've had, because you've, no matter what, you still had to plow through. I mean, for goodness sakes, you're a black woman <laughs> in medicine, my God. <laughs> um, what, what do you think um, black women need to take and men too in medical school mm. and STEM pipelines to um, to get through this. Yeah, I I always kind of hate that question because it, it continues to put the burden back on us, right? Like we know. to continue to put, it's like, all right, continue to fight and, and like break down these walls that someone else built. Like, you know, be resilient, <laughs> you know, against yeah. all of these things. And so what I would say, at least that helped me um, kind of like, plow through the through the mud and muck over the last like 12 years of higher education um is, is one like a good a good sense of direction you have to know you're doing it for yourself and not for anyone else um that's a really really big and important step because it, it's very easy to get you know kind of on a path and like this is the only career and we we're just talking about there are a lot of incredible careers in stem and things that can that um, you can have a lot of impact on the world. So just whatever you're driving towards, whether it's engineering, medicine, whatever, like make sure it's like in your heart what you want to do because that is always what's going to be safe to fall back on and enduring. 
Two, um, finding a good community. I think there are tons of organizations out there um, in undergrad as in the National Society of Black Engineers. And so that was a support um, group that of, you know, black engineers that are doing great things in med tech. There's med tech color, um, a bunch of um, black C-suite executives that are have made their way in med tech. Um, similarly, there um, every med school will have like, you know, organization for black students and just it, it's nice to have a community where you can, you know, where you don't have to code switch, where you can really talk um, you know, candidly about the struggles, about the things you've experienced. I went to medical school in Dartmouth at Dartmouth in New Hampshire. Um, oh, which, the yeah. ivory tower. The, the ivory tower <laughs> in, in in the frozen tundra. Uh, <laughs> I love. I mean, I love it there. I love. I mean, I love the community. I was I was at Dartmouth too for um, mm -hmm. business. Um, you know, business classes yes. and business cohorts, and it's a. It is so white. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. There is no, there is no other way to put it. Is there anything more to say about that? No, nope, <laughs> that that is it. And so, um, yeah, that, that was like in, which I I will give the university credit. They do a good job trying to make the classes diverse, but you can only do so much with like just the college campus, right? The second you step off campus, go anywhere. Um, and I was in the medical school, so we were doing rotations at the hospital and all around New Hampshire um, and Vermont. And yeah, there I mean, wasn't a lot of people that looked like me. I mean, there's no place for you to get your hair done. Where oh, did you no. get your hair done? Like, did you, have to, to did you have to fly to New York from Boston? <laughs> Boston. Yeah, see what I mean? I mean, you know, that's a that's really a get my hair done for like four years. Was right there. <laughs> You're black woman can't get your hair done. I'm sorry. Exactly. No, it's real. So there actually yeah. there is a there was like a Black Student Alliance for the undergrads, and like once a year, um, like a hairdresser would come up from Boston, <laughs> and everyone would like try and like book an appointment with it because we're just like we need this that is so, i mean listen, right i don't know i'm just like you know what that's a, that's a, that's a lot of ish right there it really yeah. is i mean to, to, it was right around the time i finally like <laughs> really went natural because i was like i know there's nowhere i can get a perm or relaxer yes like, like, yes <laughs> and you know like, what yeah. and you know i i'm really glad you said that because <laughs> the pandemic has created me being natural my hair used to be <laughs> middle of my back and I cut off all my processed hair just like because I was like yeah. I'm not going to the hairdresser I don't we, we're in a pandemic mm -hmm. I don't have a back I'm vaccinated now but at the time yeah. I was like I'm not getting mm -hmm. I'm not about to get no COVID I'm not going to get right. I was like yeah it's a cover for straight hair no yeah no I don't need it I don't need it so um <laughs> but I, I love I love this because I feel like you know the the you know I mean yes Dartmouth is a challenging place you know just location wise the cold the, the lack of blackness and it's just a lot of general lot culture of, of like New England <laughs> yeah I mean it really there's a lot going on um so I think it's it's pretty significant that you made it through that environment and you know you came out whole um it brings me to the question because you are a black woman and you you know been able to navigate and experience and and live through lots of amazing things and come out beautifully wonderfully multi-dimensional um last month we had a conversation the day that uh uh chauvin was um was um basically said you're going to jail which is amazing we had a conversation yeah, with dr michael eric dyson and the question we posed was where are all the black male doctors and i want to ask you you know your opinion around this because um, there is like this black woman doctor, black male mm -hmm. doctor riff, like, like, you know, there's black women doctors have, you know, that are on the path have seemed to have more support or there's more of us, I'm not a doctor, mm -hmm. more black women doctors mm -hmm. and there's less black male doctors. And I'm wondering what is your opinion about that? Where, where are they? What is, what is happening? Why are there not more black male doctors? Because we really need more black male doctors. I agree. Um, I, I think I have I have a very interesting opinion on this, I think, um, which I'm not sure if I've articulated before. So um, over the last 20 years or so, generally in medicine has skewed, has started skewed more towards women, just in general, like med school classes are getting largely more women. And I think that is really impressive. And with us, you know, with all women will come black women. I think what's difficult, particularly for black men, is one, that early support um, of just, pursuing something that is kind of seen sometimes as like caring. Um, I think men are more often in medicine are in the procedural specialties and things like that, which tend to be more competitive and likely will get discouraged earlier from pursuing mm. that path. Um, two, it requires being very vulnerable and putting yourself out there in a lot of different situations. And I think a lot of black men have, have 
taken maybe unconsciously to not put themselves in situations to be misinterpreted, to be um, mistaken, to be seen, you know, to make people uncomfortable. Like being being a pre-med student, being a shadower, like you're following doctors around and you're going to patient rooms mm -hmm. and like they are, they are allowed to say, oh, I don't want a student or I don't want a, you know, someone observing. And like, it's very different to see, you know, a, 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 even still a black girl, but at least, at least a woman who looks a little bit more threatening and, and definitely to see a black man come in behind your doctor who's gonna observe a pelvic exam or something like that. I think there's a lot of these situations that are subtly turning, you know, black men away from kind of going through this like long process of, of, of medical education. Cause it requires mm -hmm. a lot, like, and I, I don't even recognize it anymore because I've been doing it for so long, but even I do lots of things on a daily basis to make people comfortable with my presence. Right, and, you know, everyone talks about like the the unspoken silent labor of like black people just to make people comfortable around us. And in medicine, like we need to quickly gain the trust of our patients, and so it requires a little extra work for someone that looks different than someone who's typically seeing what a doctor looks like. Like how like I have to work really hard instantly to get a patient to trust me, to know that I am competent, to 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 want to work with me, and and understand what I'm doing. And I think that barrier is even harder for black men. And I think that that's what's happening. You know, it came up, it did come up in conversation where there's been, uh, we had four medical doctors, um, black male medical doctors on the panel where Dr. Dyson moderated. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they've had situations where patients have said, I don't want you because you're black, <laughs> you're a black man. And um, that's really interesting. And um, it's, 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 it causes me some anxiety because I've been very intentional about finding black male doctors because I have three black sons, right? And I want them mm -hmm. to, see to see black men as doctors in their world. Um, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, that's that's the that's the space after, right? That's after the, you know, when the man's older and becoming on the path of being a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that we need to start earlier with black children? Um, do you feel like we need to do something to get in the pipeline much earlier and and how do we even do that i mean what does it look like and this applies to black girls as well and we need we need yeah. more black women doctors it's not just black men but we need more black women um i think it's just exposure. where's the intervention go ahead yeah no, so i i think a lot of it is exposure and even mm -hmm. i like i in my family i'm the first one to go into medicine so i didn't necessarily have like Oh, you know, mom's a mom's a physician, which in a lot of generational white families, they already like everyone's got a family member that's you know some kind of doctor or something. Um, so at like so at like graduation, for example, when you were graduating, you saw mm -hmm. white families that had generations of doctors showing up at graduation, yeah. but you didn't. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. of course. Like and you and at, as at, in medical school, you can also have your family member that's a doctor do your do your hooding. Um, they'll do that. So oh. some people like had their parents like put them um, when you get your degree. And so like that, that just right there, you know, it is if it's been if you've been exposed to it as a career path for someone in your family, for as long as you've known, of course, it seems like something that's reasonable for you to pursue. But right now for, for young black kids, it's still like a, oh, this is something like really special and out of there. Like, yes, I know there are some of us, but like, I have to be ready to like, take that, you know, to fight the good fight and storm the castle in order to achieve this versus other things that they might already know are a little bit like a, you know, they know they see people that look like them in that path. And so I've done a lot of trying to do, um, you know, little like the summer programs and, and mentorship programs, talking to middle school, high school um, students. I did a lot of work with the Boys and Girls Club back in Durham, um, just doing like little fun science experiments and talking about like different jobs in science. And, and you know, there's, I think it's easy to, to just see what's around you and be like, okay, that, this is what I see, this is what I can be. Um, if we can just show people that there's more things that you that you can be, I think it'll expand the mind of, oh, what do I wanna, what do I wanna be and what do I wanna do? Um, there's also what I've noticed, a huge, huge problem around, you know, like financial stability. Yes, being a, a doctor eventually will bring you financial stability, but up until that, like I have over $300,000 of student loan debt that, I'm hoping I will be able to pay back, but for a lot of for a lot of kids, for a lot of students that don't come from a, a background that could support that, that their family can say, hey, that's a lot of debt to take out for, you know, a payout maybe many, many years down the line. Like that's a, that's a really big ask for, for a lot of to say like, okay, and make sure you stay with it now because now you've also, you know, taken out 
all this debt. Whereas like, oh, you can go get a job sooner and you start having an income and now you're financially stable. Like it's a big ask to say, hey, yeah, take out hundreds of thousand dollars of debt, continue to be in school for another eight years at least. Um, and then, you know, hopefully you should be able to pay it back. Um, and wow, I mean, you family, really, yeah. really have to. <laughs> You really have to want this. I mean, I feel like you really have to want it. And I was talking to my cousin, Dr. Shakoy. She's uh, at, um, I think she's at Baptist Medical. Mm -hmm. She said that um, something's changed in uh, um, the way uh, medical bills are paid or the way doctors are paid. And she said that's, you know, also potentially causing trouble for not just mm -hmm. black people, but for a lot of people decide, I don't want to be a doctor now because I can't get paid. Um, have you yeah. heard things like that where there's actually, you know, that space, which might be even more discouraging to black people, especially when you're saying if you come out $300,000 in debt and I can't get paid, why would I, why in the world would I want to be a doctor, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, you know, can't even get me started on the, the problems with the American healthcare system. Yeah. But basically, you know, back in the day, being a physician was like the most prestigious thing. You got paid the best of the best, right? And and it's just not like that anymore. Like a, a average physician salary is the same as what you know most creatives make. Any people with like kind of professional degree would make. But we're taking out a lot more debt um, to to get there and, and delaying kind of our income for several years. Like I'm 30 years old and I'm still like don't have my first real job. <laughs> you know, I'm still I'm still in training. And so um, a lot of the structure for reimbursement has changes. It's becoming more of a, a fee for service, more of um, hospital coding, or you know, you have to meet these certain milestones to make this much of your salary. Where it's you're feeling le it's less about the patient interaction, care. what you're doing in the care, and you're and becoming more of like a service industry, um, and you're kind of under the purview of hospital administrations, and so like they're the ones making the money, and you're just working for them, and and that really that really takes away from it right like a, a, a lot of the beauty and the fun and drive to go into medicine is that one that patient interaction and feeling like that is what's important and doing that well is what pays you and like it brings back it as opposed to saying like oh i need to see x number of patients in x number of hours in order to like meet my rvus and therefore to actually like get x percentage of my salary right that that ch completely changes the dynamic of the job and then similarly patients on the other end are seeing Hey, my doctor doesn't even look at me. I almost had ten minutes of a conversation with them, and then they were on the computer the whole time. And it, it's so funny that, like the, I think the powers that be, the people that aren't in it, are are kind of creating a system that's damaging both sides, both the doctor and the patient, because they're they're creating conflicting, you know, incentives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really uh, there's a lot of challenges that we're faced with, and I think that to me, when you add up all the things we're talking about here, not being paid well, and maybe losing some of the prestige around being a doctor, coupled in it with being in a pandemic where there aren't any black doctors and black people are the least vaccinated and dying the fastest in America, specifically American blacks I'm talking about, I'm not mm -hmm. talking about other countries. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my question always becomes, what in the world are we gonna do about this? I mean, we can't convert the medical industry in the United States to, you know, based on artificial intelligence, right? And robotics. Yeah. I mean, we still need- They're trying know, sometimes. <laughs> well, I know they are, today. but I mean, you know, hence, you know, you're setting yourself up for super success in that space, you know, with a product background. Um, it just makes me wonder what, what needs to happen to inspire a young black mind. And that's what the CPAS Foundation is working on, trying mm -hmm. to show representation, inspire young black minds to decide they want to go into medicine, right? I mean, there was a time um, from what I understand from the from the people that founded the organization, you know, in the 70s, there was a huge push to get women and blacks in medicine and it worked. And then that slowly became um, that slowly the United States started disinvesting from that type of, a you know, process to get women and blacks in medicine. And so now it seems like, you know, the fortunate can get through or the mm -hmm. super brilliant like yourself, right? <laughs> Otherwise, there's outside forces that sort of discourage, um, you know, young black people that have a beautiful mm -hmm. curiosity to go into medicine. I mean, it's not just, it's not different in technology and engineering as well. I mean, engineering mm -hmm. is the same way where um, it's not just black people that can't get in, but women can't even get through engineering, right? It's like women yeah. cannot get through the women engineering can. space. Um, and that actually is something that I want to talk about too. So. You wrote an article um, in General Surgery News called Black Exhaustion, right? Mm -hmm. And it, like when I'm talking to you about this, I'm feeling that, but I feel this all the time. I mean, this is not like yep. suddenly tonight, today, you know, I'm talking to Dr. August and I'm like tired, I'm exhausted being a black woman. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a state. 
Um, but why yeah. did you write this, right? What does it mean? And what are the consequences of black exhaustion? Um, and what do you think we need to do to prevent it? If there's even a way. Yeah, I I think the purpose of it, so I wrote that with two of my other co-residents, Kirby Yolorda and Wilson Alubia. Um, we are very fortunate in that we are actually all in the same general surgery class at Stanford. So of a class of seven, there are three black people, which is kind of like unprecedented. There's a few other programs wow. that have done this, but um, we felt very, very fortunate. And um, we thought a lot around about what it means to be a palatable black person you know, to, to, to be like a palatable the, the kid, black person. Exactly. The, 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 when you're, when you are, we were all the ones, you know, when you're younger, you're like, oh, you're not like other black people, right? Like everyone, yeah. you always got that. And so like mm -hmm. our whole lives are kind of around that, you know, uh, that title. And when everything was happening, when the world was finally accepting that there are these huge racial inequities, um, this brutality against people of color, against black people specifically. Um, there's this thought that like, it didn't affect me, right? Because I'm a different kind of black person, right? Or or, or Dr. Yolorda or Dr. Alubia, like th that we're like, that's not really about us. It's about mm -hmm. other black people. And, and we wrote that to say, no, like this is also us, like we, that could happen to us. Like, and, and just like our white coat, our MD, our like degrees, our pedigrees, isn't gonna protect us on, at a traffic stop. Like we we have those same fears. And just because um, you see us in these like high positions and areas doesn't mean that we aren't also afraid, that we aren't also heartbroken, that like these are our families, these are our people. Um, and it, we just thought it really important to convey that to our colleagues. And because like I said, there was just a sense that like, Oh, they're fine because it's not it's not them, right? They're not they're not in the hood. They're fine, you know. And and it just really was important to say like, no, that that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the the consequences of, of black exhaustion are interesting in that it, they only kind of come up when you when you realize when you take the time to sit with it. Um, I think so many of us are used to just moving through the world because we don't know anything different. Um, like I. I don't even notice when I when I code switch anymore until I didn't even know there was really a word for it until you know the last a couple of years, right? We finally put a name to it, but we've just been doing it forever, right? <laughs> like no one you knew when you were in certain situations how you could act and, and like to get people to, to either take you seriously or who you're with or what was going on. And so I think just putting names to it and, and allowing us to have those feelings and recognize that it's okay to realize that when there are days when we're just feeling particularly beat down, that there's a reason for that. We're not weak. We're not, you know, being too sensitive. Like, no, these are real social like consequences of how we have to navigate the world. And I think it's so powerful to just, just to be able to name it and say like, it's okay. And being like, I also understand this. And also give, gave our colleagues a chance to, to, to learn, right? Um, you know, people want, for the most part, I like to think the best people want to be allies, want to be understanding. So you have to get, you know, you have to provide some opportunities for people to learn, allow them to, to be supportive so that they know, you know, what's going on. And and then also on the other side, it exposed some people, right? That that everyone thinks medicine is this positive echo chamber of like acceptance and wonderful. And everyone's gonna be like, oh my gosh, absolutely. Let us be, you know, accommodating and understanding. And like, there were definitely some comments that were like, I roll blah 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 right, um, and, right. and, it, and it was and it was nice to to actually to put that forth and say see this is why we're still having these conversations because if you just think that everyone thinks like you you're like why are we still having like why are we still talking about this didn't we solve this in the 60s you know uh, and you're like nope they're still here <laughs> so yeah right. it was it was it was a lot of um of good and different feedback from that article yeah, I don't think there's a way to get rid of black exhaustion. I think this is just a state of being, which is why black people have social determinants that are health, like high blood pressure and diabetes and things like that. I mean, somebody once said it's, you know, it's 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 down to our cellular level. Mm -hmm. Um and um it's just it's it, you know, it's it's a it's a real thing. And I think um there are I don't I don't I mean, listen, we we don't crack. And many That's on many true. levels, <laughs> we, <laughs> we can't to, afford, right? We can't, we can't afford to, right? I mean, we can't afford to. We have to, you know, we have to stay together. We have to keep together. I mean, 
you know, there's statistics out there that talk about by 2053 or 2058, where, you know, black Americans are heading towards zero net worth. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's, yeah. that's horrifying. That's an absolutely horrifying thought. So we just have to keep striving and doing more and, and doing better. And I know that earlier you mentioned, you know, that, um, you know, and I understand it because I agree with you that, you know, sometimes you get angry when people ask, well, you know, what can we do about this? Why is it always on, why is it always on us? Well, because no one else is going to help us. How about that? I mean, no one else is right. really going to do any of this. And now I think because of the pandemic and some of the things that have happened over mm-hmm. in 2020, um, particularly that was, you know, catalyzed by the murder of George Floyd. Um, I do think that there is some recognition at some levels that things do have to change. And I, and I think it's, not really because of any kind of, um, this is my own personal opinion, my own views that from as Ginger Burke and Bill not to see past one day, so I just was level <laughs> set that right now. Um, but um, I do believe that part of the um, the change really isn't because there's some certain, there's, a, there's, there's now suddenly this, um, you know, I really care about humanity. It really becomes, you know, white people looking in the mirror saying, what is this? Who am I? Where have I been? Where did I come from? It's really a self-preservation act. It's not necessarily an act to try to help someone else. It's really just a recognition and realization that um, I can't believe I didn't see this and I didn't know it and what's wrong with me and I've got to actually do something to fix myself, you know, in order to go to the next step. So I do think that, you know, everything is always for yourself, right? Everything you do is to yeah, for yourself, Absolutely. you know, outside of Mother Teresa or, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, exactly. Were like, and that's okay. Like, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. right. I mean, these, you know, Malcolm X, I mean, these people were 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 very different. I mean, they were mm-hmm. some kind of energy force that was all about, you know, the humanity all within their brains, right? But most right. people are, are trying to save themselves, you know, no matter what is happening. Yeah. And and that's why I think there is some change happening, is because there's some white people that are trying to save themselves. And, you know, it's unfortunate that we had to get here for that to happen, but you know, this is any little progress better late than progress. never right we'll just progress. We'll, we'll it's, take right? that. it's a little bit yeah. of a little bit of progress you know so you know let's let me just switch gears a little bit here because i am fascinated that i went to your instagram channel it's full of horses black <laughs> girl on a horse and yes I mean, i'm like you know there's this this whole thing right now like black women horses in nature and i'm seeing so much of this and mm-hmm. not like i didn't see it before but now i feel like i don't know if it's, it's everywhere it's yeah it seems like it's everywhere to me. Or how about this? It seems like, you know, black women are now saying, I love nature. I love horses and I'm not ashamed. Like I am, this is me. I am, you know, multidimensional. Mm-hmm. I'm not, you exactly. know, um, I'm curious, um, you know, you obviously love horses. And I recently read, and I actually had my own experience. I was in Arizona and um, I took a trip by myself for the first time walking in the desert, you know, barefoot. It was great. But I had an opportunity to like, talk to a horse. And I will tell you, the horse did not talk to me. And I was told by the horse trainer or the horse whisperer, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not the horse, it's you. <laughs> right? And I was like, what? <laughs> What's wrong with me? But you know, I, I, get, I get it. Like, I'm like, okay, so talk, like, why are you an equestrian? What is it about horses? Why do you feel so comfortable around them? And is it true that you can communicate with a horse are you able to do you obviously can do this oh yeah yeah um, look at you you're I like mean, I'm gonna say people can communicate with their dogs right that are like really close with their pets and it's it's another like they're another intelligent creature in the world and you create horses a bond are another level though they're not like yeah. dogs true they, they no, are no. they are a different level they're and they're actually quite big it's so funny I would bring my friends around and, and I've gotten used to it now and they're like these things are huge. <laughs> but you're just like, what? Yeah. You get like, used to it, right? Like really tall like brother. Tall. Yeah. I mean, um, but like, what is it like how, I mean, you don't have to talk about how you became as a question, but what is sure. the experience and love of, of this right now? Has it become more intensified for you because of the pandemic or is this something you've always had or is yeah. it is it nurturing? Is it health and wellness? I mean, what is happening with that I, you? along as a kid that always liked to try things i saw a movie once about horses and i asked my parents if i could start taking lessons and they were like sure um <laughs> me always being incredibly competitive um i then wanted to be really good and I actually started show jumping when i was about 10 or 11 years old and then had to stop because it's an incredibly expensive sport not right. made for black people at all yeah. um i remember when i was little the only other black person i had seen around the showgrounds was paige johnson who was the son 
or the daughter of Bob Johnson who owned B T at the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very different. They have a whole, they have a whole ranch. Yeah. They have an you, entire like, you know, different... like resort ranch thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I was like, oh yeah, another place where it's like, you don't belong here. And so again, always comfortable in spaces that I was the only. Um, and then during the pandemic, I, I got back into it thanks to my my amazing fiance who was like, hey, you, you, I had always talked about it as this thing I loved and wanted to get back to, but like didn't have the money, didn't have the time, didn't have like anything. I was just like, all right, I'll have to just get back to it someday eventually. Um, and then like I said, the pandemic came around. Um, I was able to to work some extra shifts and get a hold of the job and a few other things to like scrape together some some pennies to do it and got back into it and it's been the best thing in my life. Um, I can you ride like, any you horse? You can ride. I I can probably ride any horse. Like I, I at this point, like I'm good enough to ride any yeah, horse. Okay. Um, I, the way it works, like you usually have your own horse to compete on, but I've never actually owned my own horse um, just because I couldn't afford it. I've always either leased, which you literally can lease like a car, um, or um, did catch riding, which are uh, horses owned by other people and you just show them to help them get experience. And so um, I just think it's so cool being able to like form this partnership with this gigantic animal and like traverse the world and giant obstacles. And we're jumping like four foot fences and like there's like, um, I actually overheard this at a show, my most recent show, and it was and it was so profound, um, which is, is going to sound very silly because you're not a horse person. But anyways, I'm going to share it regardless, is that like at the core of what we're doing, it's she's like, you know, we're jumping farm animals over sticks. She's like, that's what we're doing. And she's like, and we are always seeking that perfection. And when it happens, it's addicting. It's like, that's why we are all so addicted to this sport. It's like, it's re trying to seek out that like, piece of perfection again um because at the end of the day she's like farm animals and sticks like that's like that's like that's what it i is. love like, that right and so i was like and i think it could just be applied to so many things like boil it down to like what you're doing and what is it like that's like driving you and i think for for a lot of the equestrian world for a lot of horse people that like at least like competing like me because i'm just incredibly competitive it's like you're taking something that like would be really hard and like probably shouldn't really happen um or, like doesn't happen naturally and you're like creating this beautiful thing out of it. And you're like, you know, it's not gonna always be perfect, but the times that it is, it's the best. <laughs> it's the best, wow. Yeah. You know, I really love that. I love this conversation. I'm so grateful that we had it. Um, you know, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> me today to talk to all of the course. young students that will see this on um, Facebook and YouTube, definitely. Yeah. And definitely to the CPETS Foundation team that's gonna really be delighted by this conversation and delighted to Hello. listen to you. Really appreciate you. And I wanna thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. August, um, and good luck with all of your new adventures and everybody should follow. Um, where? What is your Instagram channel? Which one is the best my, one? My Instagram is Ari Kari. It's an old one. It's A-U-R-I-E-K-A-R-I. -E um, and I couldn't keep it Black Girl Surgeon because I keep a lot of different content. It's everything from horses to medicine to my outdoor adventures to just like general life things. And so that one's more of just like Ari Kari, <laughs> just me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I'm excited to keep following you and see what you're working on next. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. everybody. And we'll see you next time. All right. Thank you for having me.